Hello again, Northridge family. I'm Pastor Chris Geyer, Pastor of Discipleship here, and I want to welcome you to week three of our small group series as we journey through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and I hope that you have been enjoying it as much as I have, and it only gets sweeter from this point forward. We saw last week this great prayer of the Apostle Paul, the prayer that was Christ-centered, that the eyes of their hearts would be opened and enlightened to the truth of the gospel, and that they would see God's grace at work in their midst. And now today, as he continues this journey forward, he stops and he says in chapter 2, and we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he says, and you, and you. So not only was this a message for his original audience, the, the Jews and the Gentiles who composed that church or those churches there in Ephesus or around Ephesus, but it also very much under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit involves us as well. And so he has some, some dramatic things to say. Two things in particular is the, the why we need to be saved and the how God achieved that. And then when we look at the how or the why, excuse me, the why up front here, we see that it doesn't paint a pretty picture, but it's a necessary picture. This is the black drop of, of sin and our desperate need to be rescued. And it magnifies all the more what comes in the second half of this section is God's grace, His amazing grace totally appropriate descriptor of what God has done for us. He's shown us amazing grace. Now, we see here, too, that we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked. And this is just a general description of the reality of our life outside of Jesus Christ. As Paul will say later in this letter in Ephesians 4.18, he says, we've been alienated from the life of God. That's spiritual death, spiritual alienation, spiritual separation. We don't have life. Now, this is very much countercultural because our culture tells us that we're good people, fundamentally, at our core, at our hearts, that good people that just tend to do bad things sometimes. And, and we know that, that all people are capable of goodness. Theologically, we get this from Genesis 1.27, that, that God has made us, all people, all men and women, in His image, and so we're capable of doing good things in the sense like a company commander might throw himself on a grenade all right, to protect his, his team. Or uh, the neighbor may help his elderly neighbor do errands, run for groceries, and, and get around town. Those are all good things, right? But what this is teaching us is that at our core, at our heart, spiritually, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Okay? And further, if we take that further, that we are unable to save ourselves. There's the line from the Princess Bride, Max, there. He says, well, he was mostly dead, okay? We're not mostly dead. We're totally dead, unable to save ourselves, again, spiritually speaking. Dead means dead. We don't need just a mere fine-tuning. We need a drastic overhaul. So perhaps you're familiar with the illustration of we're out here, we're just bobbing in the ocean, and we need a rescue, and Jesus comes by in his boat and throws us a life preserver and, and pulls us up, and we're rescued. We're on the boat. We're safe, right? But that's not the biblical picture that we see here in these first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. The biblical picture of dead means that we're at the bottom of the ocean, okay? We have no life within us. He needs to come down, dive down, pull us out of the water, put us on dry land, and breathe new life into us. So much so that our synapses start firing again. The heart starts beating and pumping the blood, and we have the breath of life come into us. That's the picture we see here. This breathing of new life, this resurrection, this res resuscitation. Okay, But we see more things here as we advance as well. We see that we had followed previously the ways of the world. The ways of the world that uh, that we're following the course of this world. What does that mean? Well, the way that world is used here means that it is a system that is against God. Maybe overtly, okay, or maybe not so obviously. But nonetheless, it's akin to our secularism today. It's just a without reference to God. It's the value system that's so often at odds with the Christian worldview and Christian values, okay? That's who we were previously outside of Christ. We also see that we followed Satan and that we followed our sinful desires. So there's very much a spiritual battle going on here. And there's also this antithesis between our affections and our lives before Christ and our affections and our lives since coming to Christ. 
And there's an important distinction made here, too, that we see. You see, we were carrying out the desires of the body and in the mind. So God created us as physical creatures, and we have desires, and some of those desires are just perfectly normal and good and part of what it means to be a human. But then when you throw sin into the mix, it's tinged with sin, and those desires oftentimes become twisted and they become sin. Here's some examples, all right? So the desire for sex can be twisted so much so that it's lust and perversions, okay? The desires from food for food can be twisted to become gluttony. The desire for relaxation and leisure, leisure can be twisted and to become just slothfulness or laziness, okay? But not only in the body, we also see in the mind here another distinction. So there's the externals, but there's also the internals. And the internals include sinful attitudes like, like pride and jealousy and selfish ambition and resentful attitudes and a bitter spirit. And I could go on and on, but I think you see what what I'm getting at here. It's these distinctions, these distinctions that our previous lifestyle, which was twisted by sin, that tended to mark us. But no longer, Paul says. Because what comes next has been described as some of the sweetest words in the entire Bible. And I don't want you to miss this. Look at verse 4. Verse 4. Two words. But God. Again, the sweetest words in all of the Bible. But God, if you see how black the previous life was before Christ, now you see this jewel that shines so much brighter against the backdrop of our desperate need. And who comes to our rescue? None other than God himself in these wonderful words, but God. So what does it look like now for us? What does it look like now? Well, we see God's character shine forth here. We see described in the ensuing verses his mercy, his love, his grace, his kindness. We see this in verse 5. By grace you have been saved. And then he picks it up again in verse 8. For it is by grace you have what? You've been saved. Okay, so if there's any doubt in our mind, that doubt is now banished. It is by grace that you have been saved. That, uh, that is not of us. We're told that this is a gift of God. That is the grace. That grace What is the gift? It's our salvation. It's from God. And this is so important. So important. How do we receive this? How do we receive this? Well, we see the means of our salvation is through faith. It's through faith. There was a famous Frenchman who was a tightrope walker. And his name was uh, Charles Blondin. So much, he was so well regarded that his name became synonymous with tightrope walking. And Charles Blondin, one, one time, he was famous throughout France, he was famous in England, and he did a tour of America. And he went to the Niagara Falls, and uh, he strung up a tightrope across the falls, 1,100 feet long, 600 feet above the falls. And uh, he went across first, he went across blindfolded, and then somebody gave him a wheelbarrow, and he went across again with a wheelbarrow, and then he asked somebody to hop in the wheelbarrow. And somebody hopped in the wheelbarrow, and he took them across. And he got back on this this trip across the wire. And then he asked those below. And one admiring fan shouted, Blondin, you are so great, you can do anything. And Blondin asked, do you really believe that? He said, of course I believe that. And Blondin said, if you really believe that, hop in the wheelbarrow. And the man said, no way, no way. Now if I was in his shoes, I would have said the same thing. But this is an example that faith, biblical faith, okay? It's not in the abstract, it's not in a generality. It's laying hold of a person and a promise and a pledge personally. It's personally appropriating those benefits which have been won for us through Christ Jesus. So let's come back to it again. It is by grace that you are saved through faith. Through faith. Faith is the means by which we appropriate it. It's not of ourselves. Okay? So if salvation is a gift, it's from God, it's His work, so that no man might boast, then who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? Well, it's God alone who gets the glory for his great work of salvation. But we see even more, even more. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And here we see the fruit of our salvation. The fruit of our salvation. What is it? 
It's good works. Now, this is so crucial, and I can't emphasize this point enough. What saves us? Going back, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, what saved us? Well, I I hope I was clear enough in saying it's, it's grace through faith, okay, that we are saved through the work of Christ. Our salvation is a gift. It's not of our own efforts, okay? So we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by faith and our works as if we bring faith to the table and then God gives us our salvation. He brings that to the table. No, it is all of God's grace and that alone. But crucially, we must keep this order in mind. It's grace that comes first, salvation, and then what? We see here in verse 10, and then good works. The reformers had a saying that they were fond of. It was this, it is that we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. What are they getting at? That the genuineness of our salvation, of our new life in Christ, of our conversion, is good works. That we will inevitably change. We cannot help remaining the same. And it's going to result in a changed life. Now I borrow this illustration from David Platt. And I'm going to tailor it a little bit for our purposes here. I think you'll see what I mean. But he says, imagine I'm coming to church one day. And, I, and the service starts and, and I'm not there. And uh, everybody's asking, where's David, where's David? Well, the, the service starts and the worship songs are played. And then just before he is set to get up to preach, he says, uh, he says um, yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, everybody, but I was walking down the highway. And if you imagine it here in our context, one of the local highways, 75, 36, what have you. Okay? He says, you won't believe what happened to me. I got blasted by a Mack truck. <laughs> I just had to get up and dust myself off a little bit. I was wowed by the experience, but I got on my way, and here I am. I'm ready to preach. And you'd you'd say, you're kidding, right? Uh, that's, That's inconceivable. Why is it inconceivable? Because you can't have an experience like that of being blasted by a Mack truck and get up and not be changed by it. And so much so that if we have tasted this grace, we've tasted the goodness of God, and remain the same, it's just inconceivable. It's inconceivable. So we see, too, that we're going to be changed. And here we see this word, that we are God's workmanship. We're God's workmanship. Well, what's that about? We're that, the Greek word that stands behind that term workmanship, poete, it's where we get our word um, poem from. Okay? It's, it's a work of art. It's a masterpiece. And I know some translations have translated this word, we are God's masterpieces. Okay? And that's, that's got an element of truth to it. That he is the master artist, and we're his creation. And we're to display his wisdom, his creative capacity, his brilliance in our lives. You know, John Stott, he's a commentator on the book to Ephesians, and he tells a story. He tells a story about how when uh, he was at Cambridge, and the principal of the college that he was at was retiring. And... Uh, to honor this man and his year service, many year service to this college, there was a painting done for him that he sat for. And it was the unveiling at this banquet of this painting, and as it was unveiling, this wise and self-depreciating president of the college, he said simply, in years to come, people will no longer ask who is this man in the painting, but rather they will ask who painted it. I think that's a brilliant picture of what our lives are intended to display. And what is it? We are to be trophies of God's skill and of his grace in our lives as we live it out. As we live it out. What is it, Matthew 5.16? On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what? Give glory to the Father who is in heaven. So let's tie this all together then. We've seen what we need to be saved from. We see how God has saved us. And we've seen that term grace. And I've said that it's amazing grace. And there's a hymn that is titled Amazing Grace by one John Newton. You know the lyrics, they're familiar to you. I once was lost, but now found, was blind, but now I see. Okay? John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. And it is amazing. The more we meditate on these verses, the more we see just how amazing grace is. But at the end of the life, uh, at the end of his life, John Newton, the hymn writer of Amazing Grace, 
said this, and I said, I think this is brilliant. He said, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be. But I can truly say that I'm not what I once was. And with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so I want to ask you, loved ones, as you read through this passage, as you work through these questions individually, with your family, with your small group, I want you to ask again and again, come back to it. Is God's grace still amazing to you? I hope it is. God bless you.